So thanks very much. Um, thanks very much to the uh, AGMC staff. I think this is a very timely topic. Hopefully I can shed some light on some of the things that we're doing uh, in the area of genomically informed treatment uh, today. Uh, I have just a couple things to warm up as I was t you know, sitting uh, this morning th uh, reflecting on uh, some of the talks that were given. I, I, I'm really a fan of uh, patient-centered uh, patient innovation. I personally have three medical devices that are enabling me to walk and use my arm. So, uh, you know, evidence-based, affordable access to things like that in terms of quality of life, you know, are really, they hit home uh, very, very closely for me. But if you think about patient-centered, perhaps there's nothing more patient-centric than DNA. And, you know, my kids are a little bit older now and they're taking life sciences courses and so on and so forth. And they keep asking me, what, Dad, what do you do? You know, what exactly do you do? You sit in the office all day and you yell at the computer screen and, you know, you're trying, you're, you're pulling your hair out, your hair's falling off and so on and so forth. And so I explain it and I explain it. Finally, my one son says, Dad, the title of the movie of your life is DNA Gone Bad. <laughs> and if you think about cancer, that's what it is, DNA Gone Bad. So we're going to talk to you today about a, a, a DNA-centric view of organizing treatment plans with respect to the use of some advances in, uh, in genomic technology. Um, cancer is very personal to me. I've lost several family members where I've held their hands in the final minutes. And some of the, the uh, anecdotes that we shared today are clearly hit home, specifically the one of getting futile treatment and then ending up uh, being transferred to the hospice in the last hours and then going through that process, which is a real eye-opener. And that's cemented in my head and that drives me personally when those days are tough and my kids are laughing at me for yelling at the computer screen. Uh, I think this is a tremendous time for courage. I was really struck by Amy's presentation. My case study today is on an inflammatory breast cancer patient, uh, interestingly, to kind of pull it all together. And if I think back, uh, I joined the lab industry at the time of the HIV crisis. And there's a lot of interesting parallels, I think, to the crisis and what has come from that in terms of advancement, evidence-based approaches, and genotypically informed treatment that I think are going to be eerily similar to the way that we see uh, cancer treatment moving forward. So I'm going to talk just briefly a little bit about who we are, um, some of the economic and clinical needs um, that are out there with respect to cancer treatment. Um, you know, a little bit about our Foundation One solution, uh, some clinical experience that we've had and have uh, recently uh, talked about at ASCO, and then that case presentation to kind of bring it home for you. So at Foundation Medicine, we're really rallied around uh, leading a transformation or helping to lead a transformation in uh, cancer care in which each patient's uh, diagnosis and treatment is informed by a deep understanding of the molecular changes uh, that drive their disease. We think that there's an opportunity in collaboration with um, a number of folks across the country to make significant improvements in the safety, efficacy, and affordability of cancer treatment using genomic approaches. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in that regard. So if you look at our business model, we view ourselves as a molecular information company. Uh, we don't view ourselves as a diagnostic company. We have diagnostics as an arm of what we do, certainly, but we're interested in assembling, you know, we're in the big data business, basically, assembling huge amounts of data and translating that information so it makes a difference at the point of care. One way that we're working uh, in this, or our pillar, if you will, of the business is working in the clinical field. So we offer a test, which I will talk to you about, uh, not only in the United States, but internationally, uh, that is used uh, every day for subsets of patients, which we'll talk about in terms of where is this appropriate and where is it not appropriate, uh, to help inform targeted treatment decisions. We're also working with pharma uh, companies and biotech companies to inform discovery, clinical trials work, uh, resurrection of failed treatments, uh, failed compounds, if you will. Uh, so that, that's been very uh, helpful as well because we're getting unique insights from the pharma side that are helping us build a database of information that we think can help improve the speed at which new treatments uh, make it into the clinic. All of this is merging together into a molecular 
information approach, which we're hopeful uh, can uh, you know, basically create a real world, real time, adaptive type of environment where we're working together with numbers of collaborators to uh, speed information. Dr. Newcomer, what he talked about earlier in terms of getting the ball going and moving faster, I think is a key essential part of that. Uh, we have the who's who that were involved. Eric Lander might be somebody that pops off the screen as somebody that you're familiar with. Uh, but these, you know, we have a collaboration of, of folks that have started the business um, that are cancer genomics experts. Um, and I wanted to make sure that they were certainly featured. As I referenced earlier, we have a number of pharmaceutical industry collaborations, but we take very seriously our academic collaborations. We're working with academic centers in the United States and across the, uh, the globe uh, with respect to you know, studying the questions that need to be answered uh, in terms of proving clinical utility of this approach. So cancer is a disease of the genome, and when the DNA goes bad, as my son likes to say, uh, that's when cancer starts. Uh, so this is a, certainly a new frontier in terms of thinking about the disease in genomic terms uh, as, uh, as opposed to histological terms only. So we see a migration from a histological view to a histomolecular view. And perhaps over time, with evidence, a molecular characterization of the disease in which the treatments uh, are organized uh, on a genomic basis. If you, uh, you look at lung cancer, lung cancer is perhaps one of the poster children uh, for this type of view. You know, even back in 2003, we really didn't have a way to subset the disease using molecular terms. And today, uh, you look to the pie chart to the right, it's quite a different story. Uh, recently, NCCN started to reflect on changing some of the guidelines with non-small cell lung cancer to, to capture some of these new uh, molecular targets, if you will, in the guidelines. And we're hopeful that we can continue to help work with them and advance that work. So there are different types of alterations uh, that are important to recognize. Typically, what's out there are what is known as hotspot tests, where you're looking for very specific base pair changes. Um, so in terms of the different types of alterations that we believe are essential to understand and test for in cancer, we have copy number alterations, uh, certainly base pair substitutions, uh, insertions and deletions, and then translocations and fusions. And in the way that we view the test, we incorporate all types of alterations into the, into the assay. Not everybody does that, but we believe in order to give a fully comprehensive answer back to the practicing clinician, that we need to look for all of these types of changes in the genes that are known in the literature to drive cancer. So each cancer is unique. This is a patient-centric, uh, you, know, uh, you know, meeting today. And certainly, uh, we haven't seen in our database any two cancers that are alike. So you can look at all the breast cancer patients that we've analyzed to date. Genomically, all are different. Uh, and we expect to see that uh, kind of profiling going forward. So clearly, there's been a shift to targeted therapy as a way to improve the safety and efficacy uh, of medications. There are a number of uh, targeted therapies that are currently available, about 40 or so. Uh, the wave that's coming in terms of what, if you look at the FDA pipeline, is significant. So in order to figure out where the targets are, we're going to have to have tools that are going to enable us to comprehensively assess uh, a patient's tumor to figure out what are the appropriate uh, targeted medications that are going to be potentially helpful for the patients. So we see this wave uh, coming, uh, and the medications are very expensive. There's no secret there. Uh, on top of that, you find that physicians are overwhelmed. Uh, we've had some data shown here today where you know, physicians are having a difficult time keeping up with the field, keeping up with the knowledge base. So the ability to take a platform like a next generation sequencing platform and be able to assess all of the uh, genes and drivers and alterations in one assay and then organize the literature in real time that's available to support the actionability of that information, we believe is is a key uh, a model that's going to be very helpful for physicians going forward. We're not the only ones in the field doing this. I mean, academic centers across the globe are certainly deploying these types of approaches uh, in practice today, as well as other commercial centers. What's also interesting to note is you know, we're speeding the time to, uh, to get drugs, life-saving drugs, to the market. Uh, we recently announced that we're 
participating in a squamous cell lung cancer master protocol with a number of collaborators to use one platform across multiple uh, collaborating entities to speed the, uh, the discovery and commercialization of entities that can be helpful for patients in this approach, uh, in this uh, disease area. And this is an area that's very efficient. I think we, we have an opportunity there to really speed uh, life-saving medications to those folks. The current model of stacking PCR test by PCR test uh, we think is, is going to go away. Um, the, you have the opportunity in a multigenic way to efficiently look at multiple different genomic alterations in one platform. That makes a lot more sense on a going forward basis. Cancer is a multigenic disease. It's driven by, you know, a lot of different things happening inside the tumor simultaneously. And to continue to stack those uh, individual uh, gene-based tests on top of each other is going to be costly. You're going to burn through a lot of precious tissue, and it's not going to give the doctors the, the answers they need to make decisions as quickly as possible for patients uh, facing a life-threatening disease. We believe that this is kind of a classic long tail slide. I have a couple in here. The current testing that's available, the arrows point out some of the tests that are available in non-small cell lung cancer today, but you're missing an enormous amount of potential actionability by just looking at those particular hotspots for EGFR, KRAS, and the EML4 ALK fusion, for example. There are a number of different technologies and approaches that can use and deploy an NGS platform, uh, ranging from whole genome sequencing, which we believe is just, uh, it doesn't give you the depth and the sensitivity and specificity necessary uh, to be clinical grade at this time down to targeted sequencing, which is picking a specific number of genes and going deep on those genes in order to find out exactly what's driving the individual's tumor. And that's the approach that we're taking, and many others are as well, which is a targeted sequencing approach. And you're probably going to see that in the literature and in the press described as such. In terms of this targeted approach, if you look at the hot spots, you look across the genes uh, in the bottom here, the hotspots uh, approach, you'll find only what you're looking for, and there's an enormous amount of alteration. The red spots are the alterations. If you do a hotspot approach alone, even if you do it in a panel approach, a collection of gene assays, if you will, you're going to miss a significant number of the meaningful alterations that could confer uh, actionability for patients. And that's why we believe that uh, you know, currently the targeted gene approach uh, is a more efficient way to give those comprehensive answers and the backup necessary to the physician to talk to the patient about a, a plan of action in terms of targeted treatment. We also think that this will prove itself out in terms of saving money over time. Um, you know, currently it's nascent, you know, it's early days in terms of doing health economics studies. We're engaged in a number of health economics studies, and I'm sure others are as well. We have a number of academic colla uh, collaborators that are looking at this issue. But you think about the enormous waste in terms of trial and error treatment. Uh, you know, the data suggests that 75% of cancer treatments don't work. Uh, if you take all of that out, and plus you layer on top of the, that information, the diagnostic odyssey of patients in my own family, going from oncologist to oncologist to oncologist to oncologist, having multiple different uh, tests done, and different trial and error approaches, I think if we can, you know, make the process more efficient by eventually, over time, suggesting that, you know, it's, it makes sense to look at the genomic drivers of the disease earlier in the disease continuum in order to arrange for uh, the most efficient approach to that patient's treatment plan uh, is going to pay off. So our test is really, as I referenced earlier, we look at 236 genes which we believe are the, the bad actors, if you will, known in the literature. The test will morph over time, as the evidence suggests, that there are addi uh, additional genes that uh, possibly could be actionable. Uh, we produce the information in about 14 to 17 days. We have a number of initiatives now in place to try to speed that process to get the answers back to the practicing clinician faster. But this is a single source one place to talk to uh, type of approach that we believe has the efficiency uh, necessary to help the, the treating clinician as quickly as possible. We talk about uh, the 
uh, the test process, there's been a, a, a great amount of interest in the uh, price of sequencing coming down. But sequencing is only one piece of the pie. There's an enormous effort and amount of resources that are required in the computational biology piece. And one of the reasons why we're located in Cambridge is we take people right out of the MIT uh, area and bring them over. And the folks that work in this space in computational biology, they're only isolated in certain centers throughout the country. Uh, and this is an enormous part of the effort in terms of making sense of big data that rolls off the sequencer. This is just an example of what the report looks like. Uh, we're trying to cons uh, consistently refine the report to make it easier to read, easier to take action on, provide, uh, there's a number of pages that are in the back after the first page that are so the supporting information that physicians use to talk uh, with payers. They use it to talk with other collaborators, other practicing physicians on the team uh, with respect to the evidence that supports the potential for actionability by alteration. This is some information that we presented at ASCO recently um, for our first uh, 2,200 or so cases. Um, you know, the number, of, the amount of failures is pretty low. We've recently published in Nature Biotechnology our validation information as part of a multi-center effort. And it, you know, to, for those that work with, you know, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue uh, and try to make sense out of uh, making the DNA work through a sequencer, you'll appreciate that having a failure rate of only 5%, and we, we're not settling there, certainly, uh, is, is a tremendous advancement. These are the, the uh, types of tumors that we're seeing. So we have the classic lung, breast, colorectal, and these are typically the patients that have gone through the standard of care therapies, and they uh, still have good performance status, and the doctors have a therapeutic dilemma. They're looking at the patient. They certainly are viable for treatment, uh, the triple negative breast cancer patient would be a classic uh, in this one. But mostly we're receiving rare tumors uh, and a lot of sarcomas, uh, cancers of unknown, unknown primary. Those would be some of the areas uh, that we probably see the most referrals currently. And the number of actionable alterations, these kind of break out those alteration classes, if you will. The hot spot, typical base pair alterations are about 31% of our experience. But we're also seeing significant numbers of other types of alterations which uh, can confer actionability. Another view of the long tail. So if you only tested for a couple of these genes and you only tested for a couple of the genomic alteration types within the genes, you'd miss the potential for an enormous amount of uh, potential actionability. And this is the one of the values of a next generation sequencing approach. Same holds true if you break it out by histological classification. The same type of thing uh, we're seeing across our data as well as those of our collaborators. So I'll finish up with a case. I'm not a clinician, so I'm not going to walk through which drugs were selected and you know, why they did or didn't work. But this is a, a case that will be published. It's been accepted for publication. A 58-year-old female with inflammatory breast carcinoma. And originally in the case report, we uh, put, we had pictures of the individual, she gave consent for that, and as Amy attested to, the manifestations of inflammatory breast cancer are significant. This person had enormous tumors expressing on her skin to the point where she couldn't turn her head, uh, which was, uh, it was really shocking to look at, the, uh, look at the pictures. So this is kind of the treatment journey that the patient went through. And the long and the short of it is the patient ended up close to or about to be uh, making a decision around hospice. They had tried all of the different standard of care approaches. And she then was referred to an NCCN center uh, because she didn't want to give up. And uh, she, her performance status was still there. Uh, she was referred to an NCCN center. And that, at that center, we were working with a collaborator there who sent us uh, her tissue. And we reported some unique alterations in ERBB2, which uh, other physicians would never have thought about in terms of working up the patient. And this patient was started on some TKI therapy and had an immediate response. So she was going from a hospice decision to within one month, she was back you know, attending functions with her family. She went to a wedding. And she actually played tennis for a period of time 
we think between one month and two months, according to the physician's uh, feedback. The patient un unfortunately passed away seven months post this point of decision uh, with respect to hospice. So there's more work to be done, right? We, the disease is, is really sneaky. It works its way around, other mutations show up, and we need to know more information. Uh, but this patient had tremendous improvement in quality of life. Her, her ability to move because the, the tumor regressed was significant. She was able to turn her head and she was able to dance at a wedding, which you know, weeks prior she was uh, destined for hospice, unfortunately. So these are some of the images in terms of the response, in terms of the tumor uh, regression. So at the bottom line, uh, the physician uh, felt very compelled, uh, and in the article, uh, once we have it available, uh, stated this individual case is so impressive in the clinical evolution that she was almost at hospice to objective, objective remission that even an improvement of three months duration is important. She actually uh, was able to uh, have improvement for a significantly longer period of time uh, than this statement. So that's where we are now. This is, we believe, the right thing to do for a subset of patients. As the evidence evolves, there'll be a wider, uh, we think, uh, list of indications that will be appropriate. 